In Unit 25 video, we're going to look at acids and bases and the definitions of acids and bases, some of their properties and that sort of thing. Uh, so this is uh, section 7.1, 2, and 3. So you probably ought to get a chance to look at that uh, before you look at the slideshow very closely after it, kind of help reinforce it. And so we're going to look at a few things. One is the properties of acids and bases. We'll look at the theories of acids and bases, something we call salt, and then also talk about acid, acid, acidic and basic anhydrides. When we look at the properties of acids and bases, we kind of summarize them in this little table right here. You'll see on the left-hand side we have our acid column, and on our right-hand side we have our base column. So here's what we find out. is For acids, uh, acids cause litmus paper to turn red. You may have run into litmus paper before. Uh, it's just there's a you know, blue form and a pink form, or red form. And if I take a piece of blue litmus paper and I put it into acid, it'll turn red. If I take a red piece of litmus paper and put it into acid, it'll just stay red. It won't change at all. Bases then actually go the opposite way. So the litmus paper turns blue in a base. It's easy to remember that because blue starts with a B and so does base starts with a B. So blue litmus paper is blue in a base and red litmus paper is going to be red in an acid in the end. So we can do that, use that litmus paper test. Actually, we have lots of different indicators we can use uh, to tell about acidic and basic properties. Uh, acids tend to taste sour a little bit. Think about vinegar. Vinegar is about 5% acetic acid, and bases tend to taste bitter. So, acids dissolve active metals producing hydrogen gas. Active metals are the ones kind of far over on the left-hand side of the periodic chart. Sodium, lithium, potassium, things of that nature. Those are pretty well considered active. It makes hydrogen gas, and actually it can start that hydrogen gas in fire. And bases, this isn't actually an opposite property at all, but bases feel kind of slippery on your skin. If you ever get some lye on your skin and rub your fingers together, it's real slippery. Uh, you can tell you've got it on there, and you can tell it's probably time to wash it off. And the other thing that's interesting to notice about these is acids will react with bases to form water and salts. At the same time, bases will react with acids to form water and salts. So look at those reactions a little bit. Let's take a look at potassium reacting with uh, an acid to to produce a hydrogen gas and kind of see what happens in that. So it's kind of fun to watch. And it's going to be right here. Okay, and so we'll start out here. And just coming along, it's going to take potassium and hydrochloric acid, hydrogen chloride dissolved in water. Uh, the 12M here means it's 12 molar. So putting in some hydrochloric acids. Concentrated hydrochloric acid is about 12 molar. It actually, you can burn you if you get it on you, but it's not one of those nasty types of burns. It just hurts when you get it on. Uh, right now, he's cutting up potassium. Potassium is a metal, uh, kind of a shiny metal. It's a sort of soft metal over there, right underneath sodium on the first group. Uh, you can see him down here. Right there, he's got it. He's going to drop it once, I think, going in. Uh, looks like that. So you've got your potassium being threatened with hydrochloric acid right at this point in time. And then if you take and drop it in, actually dropping it in will help better. It will work better. It looks like that. And you see right away a lot of heat, a lot of flame coming up. That's your potassium reacting with hydrochloric acid to form hydrogen gas. And the hydrogen gas just lights off when it does that. So let's go back then into... Here and see what's coming up next in our look at acids and bases. We have some theories about acids and bases. These date back in the 1800s, trying to figure out what acids and bases are. You can look at the properties, but you're trying to figure out what is it underneath that's going to make this thing work. And so this name up here, uh, Savant, Savant Arrhenius, is a pretty famous name in chemistry. He's done lots of different things over a wide range of areas. We have an equation named after him for when we talk about how fast a reaction can go. So he proposed the first successful theory in about 1887, and what he said was that acids are compounds that ionize, they break into ions, in water to produce hydrogen ions. And in a similar vein, bases produce hydroxide ions in water. So it's very easy for him to say, put this in, make hydrogen ions, it's acidic, put this in, make basic hydrogen, hydroxide ions, it's going to be basic. And so... His idea was that the acid properties come from that hydrogen ion that gets cut loose. So in hydrogen chloride, HCl, when I put that into water, it actually breaks into a hydrogen ion, H+, plus, and a chloride ion with a minus sign. And that's where the acidic properties come from, is from that hydrogen ion. 
Uh, acids are typically easy to recognize because we'll write them out with a hydrogen ion out in front. HCl, HBr, HNO3, H2SO4, HC2H302, that's vinegar. That's acetic acid, vinegar, by the way. You can write it out like that with that hydrogen in front. It's telling me here comes an acid. That's what this is going to be. Bases are also recognized in a different way, and the base will typically have a hydroxide in it. So I have sodium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, barium hydroxide. I'll have those types of things. Uh, there are some trickier bases. An example is ammonia, because if you look at that and go, how in the world can I get a hydroxide ion out? What it does is you put it in the water. Water is H2O, remember that, and it's sort of like a hydrogen ion hydroxide ion, if you want to think of it that way. So I put ammonia into water. The ammonia can strip off a hydrogen ion water to make to leave behind the hydroxide and so it also has basic uh, properties and then arenius also recognized that acids and bases react together to make uh, compounds called salt so here's sodium chloride that's the result of <coughs> excuse me, sodium hydroxide and hydrogen chloride reacting together the base sodium hydroxide the acid hydrogen chloride here's would be the base barium hydroxide the acid nitric acid these are the results of those guys reacting together. So the problems with, with the Arrhenius theory, one is uh, it only applies to aqueous solutions. These are water-based solutions. We have lots of situations where we may, not, we may be doing something that's other than a water-based solution or could even be in the gas phase. And we'd like to be able to talk about acids and bases at that point. And so and the hydrogen, another problem is the hydrogen ion does not really exist as an individual ion in water. It's such a really small, high charge, positive region. It's going to be surrounded by a whole bunch of water molecules. Um, so sometimes we'll take and represent that sort of poorly by saying, well, it's not really a hydrogen ion by itself. There's a hydrogen ion tacked onto a water, tacked onto an H2O. If you take H2O and add H plus to it, you get H3O and a plus. And the other part is that the Uranus theory does not do a great job about explaining compounds like that ammonia, that NH3, that you can't really see where the hydroxide ion comes from. So along come two uh, investigators from Europe, Bronsted and Lowry. This is the early 1900s. And basically what they came into is this idea. Let's make it more general and say that an acid is a proton donor. Now keep in mind that when a hydrogen ion, what is an H plus? Well, a hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron in it. If I strip the electron off, like I do here in these acids, if I strip that electron off, then all I have left is the proton. So we'll call an H plus a proton very often. What they said is an acid is a proton donor, a base is a proton acceptor. Notice how water has gone. We don't care what it's liquid, we don't care what it is. We've stripped it all the way down into something that's actually going to be somewhat useful for us. Um, so it doesn't depend on the solvent. Doesn't pan out at all. And if you look at these reactions in general terms, this is a this A here, right here, is that's just an anion that goes with hydrogen. So in the case of HCl, if I look at HCl, then the anion is going to be the Cl part inside there. Or think of it this way. Um, okay, let's think of it this way. I'll crank this up, see if this helps at all. So. If I have HCl, HBr, HNO3, just as examples here, <laughs> if I look at those guys, if I break the hydrogen ion off, the H plus off, then I'm left with that, and I have Cl with a minus sign. Remember, my charges have to stay the same. So if this is a plus one here, it has to have a minus one there. If I look at HBr, I have an H plus, and I have a bromide over here. And if I look at an HNO3, oops, H plus and nitrate ion over here looks like that. It just breaks into hydrogen and whatever's left. So when we write out this thing, HA breaks into hydrogen plus A ion. It's just an extension of what we've done up there. It's just a generalization of that. Oops. Okay, so if you look at this reaction carefully here, this H and A, okay, the H comes off and goes over and joins the water to make the hydronium ion, the H0 with a plus, and I'm left with the A minus back behind. If I look at the B, the B is going to accept a hydrogen ion from my water, so it's going to strip a hydrogen ion off of here, so that means I'll have an H and a B stuck together. Now I'll have a plus charge because he's stripping off an H plus. We're only transferring H pluses in acids and bases. 
And what's left back here? Well, if the water loses an H plus, all he's got left is a hydroxide, no H minus. And now we're explaining why these things are a base, okay, it, because they generate hydroxide ion. Okay, so let's look at some examples of this uh, in using compounds uh, from real life. So, for example, HCl and water react. Well, what happens here is a hydrogen ion goes, sorry, hydrogen ion goes from here over to here to make H3O with a plus, and then left with the chloride ion back behind. You can see that over on this side. I look at HNO3. Remember, NO3 is one of your polyatomic ions. That's the nitrate group. He sticks together the whole time. I'm going to take a hydrogen ion over to here. I'll leave the nitrate ion behind. I'll have H3O plus over here. Then in this one, I can take my hydrogen ion from here onto here, make the hydronium ion, and I end up with this ion, the sulfate ion over in here. So it's all the same sort of process. That had two. Sometimes it, it may not transfer all two. Maybe somewhere in between it's going to do that, one or two. And then if we look at an example of a base, and here's one that's interesting because it's ammonia. So how in the world do we get hydroxide ion from it? Well, if I take ammonia and react with water, the hydrogen ion from the water goes on to here because this is a base. He's going to take up the hydrogen ion. He's going to make ammonium ion. He's going to make hydroxide ion. Then we have some other compounds uh, that are of interest called anhydrides. Anhydride makes it sound like it's without water, which is kind of what that amounts to. So if you think about, go all the way back, a long time back, we talked about um, metals and nonmetals. Okay, and so what we find out here is when we talk about nonmetal oxides, when I say oxide, what that means, insinuates to us, is that an oxide, the IDE tells me I've got two elements in it. One of them is going to be oxygen. If the other one's a nonmetal, looking at your periodic table, looking at the right of the stair step line, if it's sulfur, if it's carbon, what happens here is SO3, sulfur trioxide, reacts with water to make H2SO4, make sulfuric acid. Carbon dioxide reacts with water to make carbonic acid. So my nonmetal oxides, we very often call acidic anhydrides, like this, meaning if I take and put them in water, now I've got an acid. <coughs> Likewise, in the bases, if I take an oxide of a base, so sodium is an oxide of a base, sodium oxide is an oxide of a base, barium oxide is an oxide of a base, I react these with water, and now what happens is now these can pick up a hydrogen ion to make sodium hydroxide, to make barium hydroxide, to make those bases in the water solution. Okay, so we have acidic anhydrides, which are those that are the oxides okay, of the, um, they're the oxides of the nonmetals. And we have basic anhydrides, which are the oxides of the metals. And that's our starting point for acids.